Nale Yed's memoir, A Thousand Farewells, there's so much I want to talk about in this book. There's it, there's so many levels to this book, and of course they're all interwoven. But it's um, it's partly a political book because you dissect what's happening in the Middle East, and in a very compelling way, which I love. Uh, it's a story about the people of the Middle East, but it's also your personal story, and I think for the people here in Winnipeg watching, it'll really intrigue them because you were born in Winnipeg, but when you were six, your family made the decision to go home, and home was a refugee camp. Correct. And I think that a lot of people would really have a hard time understanding why your family would do that. Well, and we did too as children. I, we, you know, you can imagine being from a place like St. Boniface and ending up in a refugee camp was quite shocking. In fact, I always say that it was probably the, the biggest, even though I've traveled so much, it was the biggest culture shock of my life. Because imagine going from green grass to you know, wide prairie sky to a cramped refugee camp with no windows, concrete hovels basically, uh, doors with rusted bullet holes and you know, uh, open sewers in the street. So it was really quite shocking. But you know, it's something that we, we've discussed as a family. It's amazing. I, you know what, what happens when you get older and your your parents become your friends and you start to talk about these things and they helped us really understand and they had then but we weren't old enough to understand that it really was about family and it was about getting to know our culture and our language it was very important to get to know the language and I'm certainly grateful that that happened because I wouldn't have had the career I had with without the language and the language of course is just one one reason why you do but it's the fact that you can understand what the people you're interviewing are going through. You have been there and you, you have been in their shoes and as a reporter and I think a lot of people at home don't realize how important it is. It's not just about asking the questions, it's about being able to understand and then and then relay that to the viewer but that connection was obviously very important. It was and I really was privileged actually to be able to kind of I guess even have a tangential understanding of what it must be like for example for a girl who lives in a refugee camp. I know what she was thinking because I lived it and so I, I think it gave me a key. It wasn't the answer to everything and it wasn't a solution for every situation, but it gave me a key to people's doors, to people's minds, and I was able to approach them as someone who had, you know, experience what they experienced and, and find out what's going on in their minds and of course the language helped because there are nuances that you can't get through a translator there are nuances you can only hear if you knew the the the, the proverbs and the songs and that kind of thing so it, I really felt that I was privileged to have that kind of insight the, the proverbs and the songs and I think that was one of the things I liked about this book as well because there's a lot there is a lot of ugliness in this book partly you know through the refugee camps that you lived in but but just the war and the horror and the terror but you talk about and I think you had to struggle with this as well finding the beauty but as a good reporter and as a, as a, a human being who's living her life over there um, you're able to find and express the beauty of the culture there particularly through the songs and the poetry mm -hmm. yeah I mean it's something I, I always say that you know it, it's it, if you look around you anywhere in the world I mean there is both beauty and ugliness I mean in, in some of the worst slums in the middle of Mumbai in India I saw absolute beauty you know women and their clothing and that kind of thing so in in the Middle East it really was about the poetry and and the, the music because when we were children actually poetry it's really a revered thing in the Middle East and we were kids we actually used to have contests about who would know more poetry than the other um, but you know so so those are things that kind of struck me as being worthy of highlighting also to, to, to humanize the people you cover because the Middle East is troubled there are lots of you know over the years have been explosions wars elections that kind of thing but that's not all there is about the Middle East there's so much more and so I felt that this was one way to, to, to show that well what you've done with with your reporting but also with this book is is made it very human and very personal um, it, it is it is your personal memoirs but what you've what you've been able to do is share the stories of the people that you've interviewed and it is what I think people really need to understand about why reporting is so important and there's a lot of people who are very cynical about the news but a good reporter makes connections with people those connections are important and you need to share that with your viewers but making those connections isn't about even if in the back of your head you're thinking okay this is a good quote or this is a good shot what's really happening is this touches me and and I want to make a difference with this. I think in a way a good way to look at this is that it, you know there's a very big difference between sort of a bias or an investment in a story and, and one in where you actually just connect with people and under, try to empathize and understand with what they're going through and I think I don't think you can really express people's um, desires or, or their frustrations without 
being empathetic to them and also being able to express that to your audience. And so I think no matter what the situation, I mean, sometimes people are angry, sometimes they're, they're very sad. You've got to be able to tap into that and to tap into yourself as a human being. How would you feel if you were in their shoes? And I often say you can't really, if, if you don't know what it's like how to put yourselves in people's shoes, no matter where they are in the world, then you have no business of being a reporter. I always say that. Um, I think that's crucial to our job. Well, this the idea of, I think, what people mistakenly think of reporters doing is that, you know, taking that mic and shoving it in, in people's face at, their, at the worst times of their lives. But when you've made that connection and the choices that you have to make as a reporter, and there's incredible stories in here, but the one of the ones that sticks out, of course, is uh, when you came to that mass grave that was being uh, that was being dug up, and and family members are there, and I can't even fathom what this must be like. But I'm looking for uh, my husband, my my son, my brother, my daughter. My, I'm I'm looking for my family members amongst skeletons. I'm looking for a scarf they wore that I might recognize. Anything to to find a tiny bit of peace and you're there with your camera to do interviews and and you make deliberate choices of you know here's a woman who is wailing in grief and you need to think about it for a second but no I can't I can't go talk to her and those and but there's somebody who does want to share his story and you need as a reporter to be able to think of that absolutely because you know what I, I mean I, I have unfortunately in the 10 years I've done this seen situations where people will sort of forget that they're human journalists will forget that they're human and approach people as if they were made just to, to yeah. give them clips you know whether it was about a war or a mass grave and I, I think that's just how can you forget that you're human? How could you not connect to somebody as remote and as bizarre that experience is to all of us because yeah. we've grown up in a wonderful democracy and a great place where these things don't happen? You still have to be able to connect to that and that person. And so there was that woman sitting on a hill. And I just, I said in the book, I mean, no journalism class teaches you how to approach a woman like that. So I decided not to. I just could not bring myself to it. But there was a man who was standing there and we had to have an exchange before he agreed to talk to us. But I found that the vast majority of cases Cases, actually people do want to tell you their story but they want to feel that you're treating them as a human being and if they don't sometimes they'll say no and a lot of people want to have their story told so that you know they see your your CBC camera and they almost you know are, are reaching out to you to say my story needs to be heard around the world and it is really a validating empowering sense when somebody is, can say I'm being heard. Yes, absolutely. In fact, sometimes we had no choice but to <laughs> actually, you know, interview people because they wouldn't, you know, in one case, they wouldn't even let us cross, the, you know, pass the road uh, without us actually interviewing them. But yes, I mean, people, in a way, it's kind of a, a give and take. Sometimes people want to talk to us. Sometimes they don't. They don't. But when they do, sometimes they'll ask you for something. They'll say, you know, can you, my message to Canada is yeah. this, or my message to the world is they have something to say. And sometimes after a while of doing that and not getting any results they start getting bored with us again in Iraq yeah. for example they just they just figured out that it wasn't really doing any good so then they stopped talking to us not all of them of course but what you talk about this in the book there are moments that are truly terrifying for you as a reporter as well uh, you know coming back to your uh, apartment the the day after a massive bomb went off uh, and you know your apartment is covered in broken glass as well um, being attacked in a crowd and being being beaten you and your camera person how do you how do you cope with that it's not easy obviously I mean that what what they always tell you what professionals always tell you is that you should talk about this and talk about it a lot and the great thing about our jobs is that um, that's what we do for a living so I get to talk about these stories and tell them and, and that kind of thing over and over um, but in this particular incident I mean when we were beaten up I decided not to talk about it on the air because I felt that what happened to us, you know, I had a, a, a runny, you know, or a, a, a bloody nose and a, a few bruises that was nothing compared to the death of about a hundred people right in front of my eyes. And so how do you deal with it? You talk with friends, you talk with professionals if you need to. I did not do enough of that, I think, because so many things kept happening to me over the years and I never took the time to actually give myself a rest and to give my mind a rest. So I actually suffered for a while of some stress and I needed to kind of just say, admit to myself, listen, I need to take time off right now and I will get better and I did because I took the time off and I was back at it. How, what has it done for you to write this book both as your own personal story but this sense of and and this is what I really hope readers do take away from this as well it is 
important stories coming out of the Middle East, complicated stories, um, but but stories that we need to know about. And and as someone who you know reads the news daily, who follows it, who thinks she understands, I learned a lot from this book because you break it down in a very very easy, compelling story. But why is it so important to tell the story, both your story and the Middle East? Well, I mean, in my in, in my case, I just felt, well, I'll start from the beginning. I mean, the reason I even wrote this book is because I felt we as the media, by nature, are focused so much on news. We're focused on the explosion or the election or, you know, some political event. And so we don't really ever see the spaces in between. Yes. And so I thought, if I wrote this book, that perhaps I can fill in some of those edges and actually tell a more coherent story where people could maybe make sense of one of the most complicated regions in the world. So that was part of the reason. Now, on the personal front, I just, at some point, I was, you know, encouraged to talk about my personal story, and I was resistant to it, but I felt if there was a place for me to talk about what's happened to me, a memoir would be the place, and also that it would be quite disingenuous for, for me to write something of this size and not delve into my own background and so it was an opportunity to do that and it was a great way actually to deal with all those things that I saw and, and witnessed and and I learned some things too even while writing this book so that's a good thing. What kind of a reaction are you getting both from your fellow journalists but also people who maybe never quite understood what does go on behind the scenes? Mm -hmm. I think I mean because it is such a complicated place I think one I think one of the best ways to tell the Middle East story is through its people. I mean, no matter where they are in all the different countries, because they are different stories, right? But the, generally, the reaction has been that that, is, that has helped them understand, and I hope that is what people take away from it. Um, but, uh, you know, again, like you, the question always is, well, why now? You're only, you know, mid-career. Why are you writing this memoir? And I, I do think that it's important at this stage, especially with the, cha yes. the changes that we saw in the Middle East last year, for people to understand the reasons why the Arab Spring happened. And I think this this is a, an attempt, my best attempt, at explaining what led up to that explosion of anger last year. Well, the political the political level is woven into the stories of people, and that is what I am. I have been unable to put this book down, and I and I I mean that I've just been riveted by this book and your own stories of of growing up in the refugee camp. Um, but the stories of people, and it's so easy to forget that when when we're watching the news and we see 30 seconds of what looks like the same place over and over again, bombs going off, and you know the news from 1975 sounds like the same news from 1982, yes. from 2004. But when you can when you can connect to the people, that is what that is what makes it important. Absolutely, and it makes it more memorable yes. too. I mean, and it helps, as you say, kind of break it down and and make people understand that you know what. It isn't that that region, I mean, yes, it is a troubled place, and yes, there are some complicated political overarching issues, but there are people who are affected by all of this, and that they, just like us, are ordinary people who want to have good schooling for their children, they want to have the best food they can provide to their children, they'd like a nice home, maybe they'd like to take a vacation once in a while. And so it isn't, I mean, we really do tend to view the Middle East and, and parts of Africa and other places as sort of these naughty, complicated, political, yeah. politically charged places, but when you walk into somebody's home, it's about schooling, yeah. food, sleeping well. There are, there are passages in this book where I feel like I'm reading a science fiction, post-apocalyptic world you know where where everything has gone to hell and all you can all you can worry about is is my child going to have something to eat today and the fact that that's happening in the world while we sit here and our biggest concern right now is this lawnmower i don't know if you can hear going back and forth and and how blessed we are but we're all still human and and we're not better or worse than the people who are in the Middle East. We're all in, the, in, the, in it together. We're, we're lucky. I mean, I've, I'm particularly lucky to, to have been born in Canada, and especially when I go to these places and I see this. I go, I didn't choose. I did not choose to be born here. It happened. It was not my smarts or my decision that led to me being born in this country. So I think we have to remember that. And I think we have to remember that Canada is not an island, that we do live in a very small world, and that with Canada becoming even more and more multicultural, that we do have to connect to this world. We do business at lightning speed with all kinds of parts of the world and that affects us here on a regular basis and so for us to cut our cut ourselves off from the rest of the world from the stories of the mothers and and children of the rest of the world is really quite short-sighted and it's it's I think it's, it's something that's out of date and people uh, you know 
may don't, maybe don't have the chance to travel, don't have the chance to have their eyes opened in the, in the way you do, but that's why we have reporters. But when you're, when you're safe in your own neighbourhood, still make those connections. Reach out and talk to people. It's not just reporters who can get things out of talking to people and read. And it's one of the things I emphasize to my students all the time is read, 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 read and connect to people. And, and that's what that to me is what good journalism is about. That's excellent advice. I think your students are well served <laughs> because it, it, does, it doesn't have to be travel. I mean, it could be learning another language, yeah. you know, on the side. It could be uh, volunteering. I mean, there are all kinds of people who come to the city who, especially here actually lately, you know, who could use the help of someone who lives here. I mean, there's so many ways to connect. And I think you just have to actually have the will and, and you can do it. Well, thank you very much for sharing your story, both here on Shaw, but also in your book as well. And enjoy the rest of your stay at home here in Winnipeg. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much, Joanne.